Felix here, and good morning to you. Unfortunately, Winston has just told me that the labor market data just in was way better than expected. And that's the exact thing that we did not want. And that's the exact thing that Wall Street's been warning us about, that the Fed might cancel the March rate cut. So I'm going to walk you through the data points here so you understand the exact setup where the market's positioned, where the risks, where the opportunities are. We can make money out of this and everything else. And it's, of course, not financial advice. It all comes straight from this guy back there, who's um, had another lovely day. Come and also join us on Tuesday before we get cracking here and learn how we make money in three steps, fully automated. And it's very, very simple. It's completely rules-based. That's why it's simple. So come and join me on Tuesday live at 10 a.m. Eastern time, where I will teach you exactly how we do what we do. And it's part of our mission to make a million people financially free, which is Winston and my my mission here. So hang on, what's happened down here with the... Uh, huh, what happened here? I thought uh, we had... Uh, Hmm, one second. One second. One, 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 one second. Bear with me. I'm trying to get that thing there, not to be in the middle of the screen. Okay, that'll do. There we go. Righty hope. So let's get cracking. Let me show you what the data looks like that we just got in. I will color code this uh, green for good, red for bad. Um, black for hideous. and no, we'll just use green and red. And there won't be any any use really for green, I, I would think. I think it's mostly red. And it's a weird thing to say that higher job creation, 216,000 jobs added to the payroll, is bad. Why is it bad? Well, it's almost 50,000 higher than expected. And it basically says to the Fed, interest rates need to stay higher for longer because inflation is still a real thing and therefore the market isn't going to like it and pre-market we're down once again. Average hourly earnings, which is inflationary, is up 0.4% more than expected. So that's also bad. The participation rate has fallen, which is also bad because again, it removes supply and therefore it pushes up labor costs. So that's bad. And the unemployment rate is lower than we thought it was going to be. That's bad. Obviously, not for people who are looking for jobs, but from a Fed point of view. You know, imagine the uh, sherry swirling, crystal decanter whirling, a sort of Fed president who is thinking we can achieve things by making people unemployed. And it really is the private non farm payroll here that's to blame. 34,000 jobs more created than we were expecting. And it's just, it's just not good. It's just not good. It's um, the exact opposite of what we wanted. Morgan Stanley had warned us of this. They're saying the expectation for a Fed rate cut in March is overdone. And we only expect a March cut if payroll falls below 50,000 for February. 50,000. What did we just get? We got 216,000. So do you really think we're going to drop from 216,000 down to 50K by February in an election year? Is that likely? I kind of doubt it. What do you think, Winston? Do you think it's likely? He seems doubtful. <laughs> this is what Goldman Sachs predicted would happen. They said if the data comes in at 200 to 250,000, which is where we are, we're going to get a 0.75 to 1.5% sell-off on the S&P 500. Wow. We're not quite there yet today, but the market's still young. We look at the live market in just a second here. And yeah, it's just, it's just tough data. City Bank said... They believe labor market data over the next three to four months will be the ultimate tell whether the Fed's dovish pivot has been successful or too late in avoiding a recession in 2024. I guess that's another way of looking at it. You can say, well, the soft landing is happening, but this isn't a soft landing. This is a, this is a soft takeoff. We don't want that. We just want like flat. Flat labor market would be good, but this is a recovery that we weren't quite ready for yet. Recovery should be happening at the end of the year, not the beginning of the year. Uh, and therefore, it is a problem. 
Now, overall, the market, is it in trouble? Well, there are a couple of things that I look at. One is how are people positioned? Where are they? How much of their portfolio is how much of their cash is right now in stocks? And it's quite a lot. It's on this scale here of zero to, in theory, 200, but which at about 160, which is the peak of 2017. It's higher than anything we've seen in 2023. It's the peak in 2019. It's the 2008 peak. So it kind of looks like we're nearish the top, right? We're looking pretty stretched. If you look at CTAs, that's algo traders, which is basically the dumb computers who just trade on the basis of technicals, sort of chart type analysis stuff that we teach. Uh, they are fairly stretched, but not massively. We have been higher. We were even higher at one point in 2023. So they could go a little bit higher. Now, this is again Goldman's. They're saying what happens is if we drop below 4,500, basically, 4481, 4481, then in the medium term, next couple of weeks or so, below that, the algo funds would start to sell. But at the moment, they're unlikely to do anything major just because of the way they're positioned. Sentiment overall is pretty hot, a bit like Winston behind me. You're a bit hot. Why are you hot? It's like open a window or something. Um, if you look at the sentiment indicator, right now we're at 1.2. And that's for you statisticians out there, standard deviations from we are where we are usually. And if I zoom in a bit more on this, you can see we have been higher but we've never been higher for a very, very long period of time. Trying to get a straight line in here, not succeeding at all. But you get the idea. There were blips where we were higher, like 2021 peaks or um, 2016, 17 peaks and so on. But it's fairly unusual to stay up there for a really, really long period of time. So the, the bullishness that we've got is nearing a peak. Not at the peak, but nearing a peak. And if you want to know where everybody is positioned. I think this is a nice little breakdown. Feel free to take a screenshot of this because it's kind of, uh, I think it's interesting. And then I'm a bit of a data hound. Institutional investors is the first bracket up here. And hedge funds are very long. Uh, future positioning is very long. The mutual funds are sort of they could go a bit longer. Foreign investors have just run for the hills for some reason. They've sold a lot of shares, clearly. And then retail, which is you and me, and that's sort of passive funds and, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> active equity funds. So these are all fund managers, but that, you know, retail people invest in. They are mostly pretty long. So on the right here, 100 is, is, is long. Uh, the active funds can still go a lot longer. And why is that? Well, they've just taken profits and they're kind of sitting on probably bond trades or cash. So, but overall, we're at about an 80 on the sentiment indicator out of 100. So yeah, you can go to 90, you can go to 100, but you know, we're, we're fairly stretched. Why does this matter? This is dealer gamma. And this is one of those things that hardly anybody understands. I thought you should be one of those people because it's it's very, very useful. So let me get my keyboard out here and I'll I'll write it out for you. I guess that's probably the easiest thing. When when dealer gamma, so when gamma is high dealers who are the market makers, the guys wafting the papers on the on the on the stock exchange, are forced to buy when the market drops and are forced to sell when the market goes up. And that essentially stabilizes the market. And we've been in this Goldilocks scenario for pretty much all of November 
December when my pen go. November, December, we were very high. And right now, we're coming down. We're still pretty elevated here, but we're coming down to more kind of average levels. And that means expect more choppiness. The market will it be possible for the market to move down more because the dealers are no longer buying shares as they fall. And to really understand that, you need to understand options, quite frankly, which is, of course, something you can do if you come and join me. See that banner out as that just pops up? FelixFriends.org slash webinar on Tuesday. I'll break it down for you and you'll become a smarter, better informed, more glorious, shinier, more handsome, you know, more fit, all of that investor just happens by showing up to one of my webinars. It's a bit like smashing the like button on YouTube. It also just makes everything better in life. Now, and then there is another little thing. And that's something that's also in the Fed's mind. And that's the banking crisis from 2023, first quarter, which has never actually been solved. All they've done is they've shoved about $150, $40 billion dollars down the throat of regional banks and their incompetent management. And that, they do that through something called the uh, BTFP, Bank Term Funding Program, which is so boring, nobody remembers it. And the amount of money that banks have sucked out of that just hit another all-time high. And the reason for that, actually, it's that it's a, it's a risk-free trade. You can borrow money from the Fed at a lower rate than if you deposit your money at the Fed. So they're literally taking money out of one pot and they're depositing it in the other pot. Uh, but it also goes to show that these banks are kind of like not in good shape. So what happens is that in March, this program expires. The Fed's going to have to justify an extension and by doing that, they'll have to admit that the banking crisis is still here. Market isn't going to like that. And that they've broke the banking market crisis, you know, the, the banking sector. And they're not really going to love that. So it's a, it's a tough one for them. And if you look at the um, regional banking ETF, which uh, it's recovered tremendously. And you kind of wonder why. Well, because they've been given $140 billion in cash, but that's meant to expire in March. So this could be a bit of a March hiccup, and it's definitely something they need to address. Now, cutting interest rates would help these incompetent banks, but you do need the labor market to calm the heck down. So if you do have a job, it'd be tremendous if you quit and went unemployed for a little while, just you know, for the good of us greedy stock investors. Would you not do that for your fellow investors? <laughs> not a serious suggestion, obviously, you know, lest somebody actually does that. Um, what you can do, if you are frustrated with which way the market's going, come and join me on Tuesday. We can make money in any market. Honestly, really doesn't matter what the market does. Up, down, sideways, back flips and all that kind of stuff. You just need to learn the three rules, rules learn to apply them. And you can do that by joining me at felixfriends.org slash webinar and life will be wonderful forever after. So come and share, join me at felixfriends.org slash webinar. And shall we have a look at the market? Let's do that, right? Where did I go? I'm here. Winston's here too. What do you think, Winston? And this is pre-market. Let me just hit the refresh button here to make sure it really is live. And it's not as bad as feared, but a lot of the uh, bankers who've just showed up for work are still sitting there going, when the grown-up gets here, do you think they're going to explain this economic data to us? Because we don't really know what that means. And that's a little bit what we're looking at. So it could get well, so it could get better, obviously. But if I look at the S&P futures, it's kind of a weird thing happening here, which to me doesn't make any sense. So we had the data out here, that yellow line there. And then we tanked about a quarter of a percentage point, which is a moderate reaction. And then we've now recovered to higher levels. That makes very, very, very little sense. And usually things that make very little sense don't last very long. Let me have a look at the 10-year yield as well, which shot up here at 8.30, which is what you would expect to over 4%. Ouch. 
By the way, there's a bond trader out there who's got a massive amount of money uh, on these 10-year yields going to 4.15%. If he exited at 8.30 this morning, he will have made a killing. I don't know if he would have been able to. Depends on how he set that trade up. And now it's kind of coming back down. But yeah, it does matter. Now, sorry, Winston wants to go out. So give me a second, right? I'll just have to let him out. He's, he's making a racket. You want to go out with the boy? Come on, then. Winston's got two housekeepers in the kitchen, and I think it's it's a uh, time when they drop food, so he doesn't want to miss out on that. So that would obviously be a, a terrible situation. Um, let me see any questions you guys have. Put them in the live chat here. Uh, this is why we do this live, especially once you've destroyed the like button, burnt an entire calorie, and served yourself, saved yourself tens of thousands of dollars on a Zempic, then um, please ask. Market recovering, it does look like it. Um, Aruna says you see a few more women. That's a magic, isn't it? We're, we're attracting five women now on a live stream. Brilliant, thank you very much for that. Is it good to buy treasuries at 515? Well, it really depends on whether you think rates are gonna come down more than expected, in which case you'll make money quickly or if you just want to hold on to something until it expires at 5.15. That's sort of the idea. I normally only buy bonds if I think they're going to appreciate in value. John just hit the super like button. Brilliant, love that. Did you see Palant here today? I have not had the pleasure this morning, but let's have a look on it. This is a minute chart, down 3.7%. Ouch. So is it that, is it that the higher risk stuff is coming down this morning? Got rid of my meme indicator, which is kind of interesting. Let's have a look at some of the more techie stocks. Yeah, SoFi is down this morning. Uh, what else? What about NVIDIA? NVIDIA is actually green a little bit, which is good. It's staying above that 50-day, important 50-day moving average line. Um, you think I'm fibbing about the calories? You double blind tested it yesterday. Well, I think you need to try over a longer period of time. 90 days of clicking the like button does wonders. What can we expect from VIX? Well, you would expect VIX to start picking up a little bit, but it isn't, which is kind of an interesting setup that we're in right now because, well, it might be just that market makers are not needing to hedge as much because the gamma has come down. I think that might actually be the explanation for it. So we're not seeing it shooting up um, as you might expect it to. So. I read something by Goldman's yesterday. They're saying that they think VIX is going to stay relatively low, partially because so many people are starting to sell options. And we've got something to do with that. You know, guilty as charged. Uh, so, yeah, we're not seeing the, the panic spike here. Uh, move, on the other hand, which is the bond volatility, is also down somewhat this morning, which is a little irrational. But that has been a little, little bit more and more volatile. Have you ever bought OTC stocks, says David? I think I probably have, yes. Not very often, but, but occasionally. Lisa, you're number six. Thank you very much, Lisa. I appreciate you for tuning in. And Saudi Arabia joined BRICS. Um, well, if you think about how Saudi Arabia makes its money, which is selling oil to the US and Europe, you know, I, I think this whole BRICS currency thing is a little overdone. I, I don't really buy it. I, I just, just look who's, you know, Brazil, really? Is that the currency you want to hold? So I, I just think it's a, it's, it's a little overdone. It makes for a great headline and the, and the gold sellers love it because they can scare you into buying more gold. I love gold, by the way, but um, not for that reason. And Marcus is right, the higher the VIX, the more money you get for puts. But if you're buying lots of puts, you actually push down the VIX. That's um, also the problem. So uh, NEO and SQQQ, we definitely look at NEO. 1.45% uh, down here this morning, which is 
you know, within yesterday's, sorry, within Wednesday's trading range, so it's just kind of a sideways bounce. We want to stay above $8. That continues to matter, in my opinion. If we look at, um, if we look at optionswatch.io, our trusted, our trusted um, options setup, then we can see that the support for the week is actually eight fifty, and then eight dollars for the month, which probably matters more. It's now seven fifty, so that's the kind of zone for February. I think it's still eight dollars. Yeah, eight dollars. So there should be a fairly decent amount of support in this kind of that'll hopefully keep us above the yellow 50-day moving average line here, which sits at 780. Do you prefer corporate or government bonds? Typically governments, because I know they're going to pay, but there, there can be nice setups for, 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 for uh, corporate bonds. Just if they pay you too high, high in interest, it's because it's bloody risky. Stephanie is asking, um, and that's, the, that's, that's the seventh female on this live chat. Thank you very much, Stephanie. During election year, does the market typically go higher or lower? Well, typically, the lot in power try to inch the market higher because it makes it more likely for them to get elected. So typically, you actually do quite nicely in election years. But that's just typical. And that could also be somewhat random. Um Often presidents come in and in year one or year two of their tenure, they start cutting taxes and they start spending more. And then the real benefit of that extravagance and piling up more debt kicks in a little later and it sort of improves the market down the road. So it could also just be luck. Um, this year, I don't think they're going to pass any more massive spending bills. I don't think that's going to go, go, go through. But... Um, there is obviously a lot of cash floating around. I think really it ultimately depends on one, of course, earnings quality, and two, is the Fed actually cutting rates, and are they stop? Are they going to stop shredding money? And it looks like it's starting to slow down, and they did hint that they might slow that down, and that would be very supportive for the market. But the trouble is, the amount of debt the government is generating is going to require about double the amount of bond purchases this year than last year. And at some point, we'll reach a limit on how much the market can absorb uh, and, and without ra rates going higher. And that's therefore, that's to me the, the, the real risk here. But so far this morning, the market seems to be shrugging off what should be terrible news in the labor market, as in a lot more jobs created. I know the market's up, but upside down. It's kind of immoral, really, but that's the way it works. And um, that's somewhat surprising, I must say. I was I was expecting me and Goldman Sachs about a percentage move down, but then we have had a fair bit of moves down the last couple of days. So maybe we did it in advance and now we're just going, okay, all right, well, it's bad, but we've kind of priced this in. Um. Russell says, where would you buy more SoFi? Now, I need to be careful on that. I can't give you financial advice. But um, if you look at this other stock chart like this, right, if you just zoom out and look at the peaks and what then happens afterwards, typically, we correct down fairly heavily because it's a very, very volatile stock. So generally speaking, don't buy at the top. Um, there are ways you could set rules for yourself. I'm a huge fan of rules. One thing you could say, I only buy below the 100-day moving average, say, which is this brownish line here that I'm painting over. And that would mean you would have only bought down here and you would not have bought up there. So you can come up with rules like that, or you could say the 30-week moving average or you know something like that. And that would be a reasonable thing to do. Um, right now, when I look at this, like from a chart point of view, where's the support? Well, the real support sits sort of at six, seven dollars. But right now, we are trading above all of the moving average lines, which all seem to be around eight dollars and a bit. So I think eight dollars should be quite good support. If you go to optionswatch.io and type in SoFi, 
Now again, link down below. There's a free 30-day trial, so you can get your your pulse on the same data that I see and 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 that um, institutions and market makers see. Click on the next Friday, the next three, the third Friday of the month, and then what you want to look at is where are these red lines, the big red bars? Where are they? Where those are positioned is where the put options sit, which is like a support line. So it's like a put wall, as I would call it. So this here at 750 is a supportive put wall this month. So $7.50 put wall support. It doesn't mean it has to you know, last, but it is it is helpful. So I would I would look at kind of that level maybe as a support. And one way you could also purchase stocks like this is don't buy the stock, but if you if you're able to buy a hundred shares, just sell a put. You sell a put option. What's going on here? It's interesting. Um and what you could do is say move that to eight dollars and say I don't want to pay eight thirty. Maybe I want to pay seven fifty, and then if it does drop below seven fifty, you will buy a hundred shares of SoFi at seven forty, and if it stays above seven fifty, well, you make a percentage point return in the next fifteen days, which isn't great, but also isn't terrible. So that's one way of of doing it, and it can help to avoid overpaying. So it's a kind of a smart thing uh, to, to, to do, at least if you've got the cash to buy 100 shares. Um, Shasby says the Fed is currently in Republican hands. And yes, you're right. Um, Chairman Powell is a, is a card-carrying Republican. Although I think he's probably more in the hands of Wall Street. I think that'd be the better way of saying it. The guy, the guy is a is a Wall Street guy. That's where he comes from. And that's where he's going to go back to, right? Sharon says, a lot more ladies watching than you think. Um, Sherry, I appreciate I appreciate both of you. Well, I look at the statistics in YouTube and it says about a couple of percentage points. So I think I think the um, the woman repeller is, is, is alive and well at this point. Maybe it's just the subject. Possibly it's just me. Um, who knows? TL says the like button is broken. I appreciate you tuning in, TL. Um, how's that even possible? I think we got how many likes we got here? I see, I see almost two hundred. So it's it's obviously stuck at your end, TL. What could be the terminal interest rate in three to five years, Andrea? Well, it really depends on inflation, doesn't it? I I would I would expect it in an normal world to go back to sort of. 2%, 2.5%, it'll sort of linger around that level. I think that would make sense. Any lower than that means the world's kaput, and any higher than that means there's massive inflation out there. Jerome, good morning to you. How's, how's um, where are you? Bermuda, Bahamas? You know, Key Largo, somewhere like that. Aruba, where are you? Are we going to start singing a BG song soon? Um, Jerome, Jerome is one of my... Um, uh, lovely mentees, and he lives on a boat in the Caribbean. And yes, he does deserve it because he's a wonderful guy. Um, Palantir is, why is it down so much? Well, I think again, zoom out and look at what this stock does. If you just sort of simplify this and you see it's a very, very volatile beast. And it's also a very heavily traded beast. So when it goes up a lot, people take profits and also bet on it going down and then they make money. Plus, it's just, it's not exactly Wall Street's darling at present. Now, S&P inclusion, which will likely happen at the end of March, and markets have just opened here, by the way, um, will likely improve this because you're going to get fund money flowing in, all the tracker fund money. They'll have to buy Palantir, and therefore, it'll become a little bit less volatile because that money will just kind of stick. But at the moment, it's just, it's just a very, very volatile stock. Jerome is in the Bahamas. Brilliant. Love that.
Uh, ding, ding, ding. You guys want to see what's happening pre-market or are you just not interested? Well, let's have a look at the S&P first. And it's actually flat, which is really quite bizarre if you think what just happened at 8.30. Um, and let me show you the futures because they traded through this. And the future traders at 8.30 here, very logically said, oh my God, they've created a lot more jobs than we thought. That means the Fed won't cut interest rates in March. They won't be able to. And therefore, the market took a nosedive. And then the nitwits woke up and said, buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip. And they have. And I applaud that because it makes us all happy, but it doesn't actually make any sense. Sort of statistically, the market should be down a percent. But possibly... The explanation for that is that, well, we have come down 2.5% from the peak, and therefore, maybe this is already priced in. That's one way of looking at it. It's bad, but it isn't hideously bad. Could have been worse. Could have been 250,000 jobs created or something like that. Um, so maybe that's the explanation for it. If you look at the QQQs, the NASDAQ, Similar story, we're trading flat, which again makes very little sense, but again, it might just be because we are down from the peak. How much are we down by? 4%. And the NASDAQ just being the more volatile cousin of the S&P, that kind of makes sense. What do you think about PayPal stock? Um... I'm actually putting out another PayPal video today. And the more I look at the numbers, the more I like it um, as a long-term play, not as a sort of flutter, because I think people underestimate how long it takes for a stock to recover and for new management to really make an impact. So I think it'll take longer than you think, but I like the fundamentals of it. I think it's very, very hard for them to screw it up so badly that it'll go down significantly in the long run. Short term, who knows? You think people have stopped believing in jobs data? Yes. Yes. I think the market has caught on to the fact that labor market data is complete gobbledygook, totally manipulated, and therefore it's less important. But typically the NFP, the non-farm payroll data we just got out, is the one piece of data that the market does actually look at. Um, not really the Thursday's jo Thursday jobs data, but this one usually matters. So I think the jury is still out to see what happens here throughout the day. Jitters in the Middle East? Yes. And arguably, that might reduce global GDP growth and therefore might be good for the inflation and good for the market. But if you look at shipping rates, 40-foot container rates, and can we pull that up? Have they got freight data in here? Freight Transportation Services Index. Um, I'm not sure that's... No, it's um, 40... Hang on. 40-foot... No. No, I'm not sure we have that in here. Anyway, container shipping date uh, rates have gone up like 60% or something last week, which is kind of crazy. I don't think I've got that data in here. Um, no. But yeah, they've gone up a lot. So that is, of course, in theory, again, going to cause supply side inflation, which isn't brilliant. Michael Jefferson, you had a chat, chat with Cheryl. That's brilliant. You know, she's worked with me for like, I think, 18 years or something like that, which is kind of hard to believe. But yeah, she's brilliant. And your lab doesn't like vegetables. Really? Carrots? A Labrador that doesn't like carrots? You sure it's a Labrador? Winston's best friend's a Labrador at the moment. He's called um, Tofu. And he's tofu colored. He's very white. And they wrestle. And they went on a hike this morning. No, they, they went to swim this morning. Well, actually, what they do, they wrestle, and then they get hot, and then they both just run off into the sea and go for a swim, which is really sweet. And then this afternoon, they, they went on a hike together, which is also very nice. So, A 
Luke Paul, uh, nice to see you on the chat. You're asking, why do you think that Alphabet is cheaper than Microsoft, Apple, and so on? And I still can't call it Alphabet. I keep calling it Google. Also, they never changed the ticker, which is weird. I think if you look at the whole AI train, Microsoft has just cornered it for, for the moment. So Microsoft has outperformed Google significantly, actually since 2018. But you look at the more recent, look at 2023, it's pretty much the same movement, actually. Google did manage to catch up. But in the longer term, Microsoft has done better. I think Microsoft is the more diversified business. Google is essentially a search as an advertising business, whereas Microsoft is much more of a subscription business. And I think the fact that they have gaming, that they have their power in most computers, they have got Office, they've got obviously cloud, and Google has that too, but Microsoft being the slightly larger one, you know, they get MOD contracts that are worth 20, 30 billion dollars and stuff. They're just the better salespeople. That's the way I look at it. I don't think their product is great but they're really, really good at selling it. So Microsoft is, I think, the one, the one to beat, really. Stephanie, your dog likes baby carrots, but only eats regular carrots when dipped in peanut butter. And how did you find that out exactly? Was there some sort of carrot tasting going on? Uh, you are silly. But whenever I go into my kitchen, I usually find Winston's nose literally in the fridge. He likes the vegetable drool particularly. His favorite vegetables are, well, he eats pretty much everything. Celery, cucumbers, um, carrots for sure. He's not allowed that many because they're a bit too sweet. Uh, broccoli he's a big fan of. Um, certain types of lettuces he likes. What else does he like? Well, pretty much everything else. Um, I walked in the kitchen the other day and they said, um, Winston likes bread. I'm like, and why is he eating bread exactly? Well, he probably snatched it off the table. Google grows massively in hardware and AI will offer huge revenue potential. I think so, yes. I think, I think it's a great business. It's just a question of who's growing cloud faster and who's got the better software offerings on top of cloud. And I think really to be competitive in cloud now, and look how green the market is, that's lovely you need to not just offer the cloud, but you need to offer the bells and whistles with it. And I think that's kind of the, the question is, who's going to do that best? I think Amazon does that quite nicely because you can pretty much plug and play any software in there, in there already. And Azure does it and Google does it to an extent too. But I think that's really the, the competition. It's like, if your entire company is run on Microsoft software, probably going to use Azure cloud, aren't you? So Google doesn't have that advantage of being the operating system of the world. Now, serious news. Tallulah, any serious news? How do you want to sum up where we are? Tallulah says, jobs data came in much higher than expected, which we would have thought would tank the market by about a percentage point. So much so Tallulah's looking the other way. But um, it hasn't, which is slightly baffling the exception of Tesla, which is down, and fat drugs are down. My only thought is that either the smart bankers haven't showed up to work yet, they're still hungover or, you know, cleaning their noses, or the 2.5% drop in the S&P this year has kind of priced this in already. Tallulah, any, any thoughts? Any thoughts? No. No, I don't think so, right? No real wisdom to be had there from this cat. It's slightly disappointing, isn't it? Spend years and years training her in the art of finance and then no opinion whatsoever. Humam, greetings from Iraq. Greetings to you too. Andre, you're talking about um, digestion. No, I think it's a problem. I think it's a question of like, are they used to eating it? Do they have the enzymes in their stomach to eat it? Uh, probiotics and prebiotics and fermented stuff is also good. Actually, the best thing actually to give your dog is fermented vegetables. That's really, really good for them. Um, any questions you have, pop them in the chat. That's what we do this live for. And um, look at the chip chart right now. Chip chart. Um, semiconductor. There is a... There is an ETF out there. 
uh, for that. Um, this will do SMH. And it's up ever so slightly, slightly below all time highs, right? So, but it's still, I mean, it's a, oh, you can't see that. Can you see that? No, you can't. Okay, here, here now you can see it. Still, now it's actually up 0.2 percentage points. That's weird. Isn't that weird? Oh, we're on a month chart. That would explain it. Here, here is the day chart. Okay, that makes a little bit more sense. We had a little bit of a sell-off. We're seeing a bit of a recovery here. But, you know, ultimately, you, you look at this and you, yeah, you are arguably below the real kind of rally, but you're still above the 50-day moving average line here that I'm pointing out. So overall, this still looks pretty good, doesn't it? We, it, it isn't as cataclysmic, this 2.5% drop that we've seen roughly, this, as people think. It's just, you know. The world likes bad news. Um, he just says, freight rates have gone higher, so should we invest in shipping companies? Um, depends on why they've gone higher. And is it going to stick, stick around? Is it just the, the Red Sea thing? Or is there an actual shortage? Um, I think that's the question. And shipping is very, very cyclical. It's fairly complicated. It depends on from where to where. So you need to understand shipping line you're investing in. What is their main route? Which route are they making money on? Which route is like their empties back and are they filling them? And, you know, what's the supply that's going to come up there in the next couple of years and so on? It's it's fairly complex. I used to cover shipping a little bit and meet with the CEOs of shipping companies. And it's you need to really understand what they ship from where to where and why and what the rates are and what their margins are and what their cost base is and all of that stuff. Uh, that really is, 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 is not as easy to understand as you might think. Aruna says fermented food is also good. Indeed. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm always fermenting something or other. A lot of job gains were seasonal. Entirely possible. Absolutely. Let me show you the, the data again we started with fair bit of data out here. Um, there it is. I'll move a little to the side so you can see it better. And the headline non-farm payroll came in at 216,000. We were expecting 170,000. So that's whopping, whoppingly higher. And average hourly earnings also went up or higher than we were expecting. The participation rate dropped, which the Fed hates. And the private non-farm payroll, 164,000 coming in almost 33,000 higher than we thought. It's pretty significant. So you can't really blame the government for this. Yes, they did, of course, in the infinite stupidity, hire 50,000 people. But it's actually the private sector that's really driven this. And therefore, this is not. It's inflationary. Very simple. It's inflationary and, and the market at the moment shrugging it off. And let's see what the bond market does with it, shall we? Let's have a look at what the bond market's doing with it. Where's my little window? There it is. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Where did I go? Here I am. Let's have a look at the two year bond yields. It's up a percentage point. And what does that mean? It says, the market is bond market saying, and the bond traders are usually a little smarter, that they think rates are going to stay higher for longer. Sorry to break it to you. And the 10-year is also up one percentage point. And this should mean that the stock market should go down a percentage point. But the stock market is saying, uh -uh. we are having a party no matter what. And possibly, let me, let's put this together. So this is the SPX. U.S. 10-year yield. There it is. And then let's invert. Can we do that? No, hang on. We need to do that again. U.S. 10-year yield. New price scale. Let's invert the 10-year. And you can see that they move together. And you can also see that today, the stock market is staying flattish, higher. 
and the yields move the opposite direction. So the logical thing to do would be for the market to come down. But it hasn't. So the market doesn't always make sense in the short term. Adam, welcome. Thanks for smashing the like button. I appreciate that. Love a good sauerkraut dish. Oh, I do too. Um, Joe, I think I think we can always trade. I mean, I think we're just going to have a period of lower volatility. It doesn't mean you can't trade SPY or SPX or whatever. You just have to be, have to look at what, what what's the return you're getting for it. And it might not be super, super high, but it's probably still a decent thing to do, you know. Um, watch what Patrick's doing. Like He's doing a great job. Earnings ahead. Absolutely that as well. PayPal's turn green has it. It has. A percentage point up. Nice. That's nice to see. And it's bounced off the 50-day moving average line here, which is lovely. Smashed through the 100-day. So it'd be really good to close above the 100-day which right now sits at 58.60. Um, so let's close above 58.60. That will be somewhat supportive. Finn, you don't like to buy stocks unless they're going up. Opposite for me. I love buying stocks when they're going down. If it's a really, really big red number, then I'm like, it's on discount. It's cheap. Let's pick it up. Um, Given that there is this banner at the bottom, you might want to take advantage of our flagship stock program as well. Felix Renz and slash stocks. It's 99% off. That was actually for intended for another video, but here it is. So feel free to take advantage of it, folks. It's um, it's going to make you into a smarter stock investor, for sure. Felix Renz and slash stocks. And we practically give it away. You pay 1% off the, the price you see there on the on the, on the the ticker. Um there we are. Any any last thoughts or questions of the day? Any any wisdom from uh, any four-legged creatures you'd like to share? Uh, do let me know. Otherwise, I wish you a glorious, happy Friday. And make sure you sign up for our live trading training on Tuesday and become a better investor all around. Even if you don't want to become a trader, understanding this will help you understand how the market actually works and flows. It'll make you a better investor all around. And it's far simpler than you think it is. I thank you for joining. I wish you a glorious day and keep learning, keep getting better. Make your money work for you. Make this the year where 2024, where your money works for you. So you eventually no longer have to work for money. That's what separates the 1% from everybody else. So if you want to be part of the 1%, you need to understand this. And it's actually fun. Money is brilliant. It's fun. Once you understand how markets work, it's, a, it's actually a great hobby that makes you money. So thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. See you on Tuesday. And 